So um, really we go back to 2010 uh, and we were looking for a, a business idea to, to generate some uh, income for us after we moved to Sky. And um, well initially it was no more than an intuition really that Isle of Sky, sea salt might be something that would work. Uh, but we, <laughs> we had no experience in uh, salt production. We had no experience in food business, uh, but we just had this idea and we started to look into salt production. <clears throat> Obviously, uh, there weren't any other salt producers in Scotland at the time. Uh, we found out about the, the salt industry. We found out that there was a salt producer on Sky some 300 years earlier, down at the south end of the island. We're at the northwest end. And um, it lasted for about 20 years. Um, and three or four years into operation, we got an email from America uh, from someone saying, I just looked at your website uh, and I think that was my great, 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 great uncle who convinced the, the clan chief of the McDonald's to set up a salt pan business down at the south end of the island. So it just shows, you know, I mean, you're never too far away from a relative of a salt producer. <laughs> so we um, started looking into it. Now, because of our background, uh, we liked the idea of a natural process. Um, didn't seem to us environmentally to be the right time to use coal or peat or, or wood. So the salt pan idea was put on one side. Uh, Solar evaporation is a great way of doing the salt, uh, but we think of it as a hot country, uh, dry climate sort of process, which it largely is. But we were doing the research and we came across some work, uh, a book by Mark Kalansky, which some of you might know, called uh, A World History of Salt. It's quite a tome, I can tell you. But um, one of the things that was talked about in that book was solar evaporation of salt in Cape Cod in the 19th century. I don't know how clear that is, but you can see the pans on the right and the roofs on the left. And what they did was whenever it rained, uh, and it's not unlike here, I suppose, <laughs> it rains, they would wheel the roofs over and then wheel them back so the evaporation process could continue. And that's a more modern replica of the approach that was used. Now that wasn't an entirely practical approach for us, uh, but it showed us that solar evaporation could work at northern latitudes. So we started looking around for a suitable alternative. Of course, we're now in the sort of 21st century. And we were able to think about polytunnels Polytunnels are very common on Sky. Uh, they're used for growing vegetables and herbs. There are commercial companies on Sky doing that, and lots of individuals. And they're really part of the, the farm vernacular. So we set up a small polytunnel with um, about 10 foot, uh, with a pond inside, just to see if it would work. We ran it for a whole season, and our season is April to September. That's when we make salt. Uh, and it worked. Now, it was still a bit, you know, finger in the air type stuff, but we thought it would work. Could we extrapolate it up to a commercial business? And so we decided that we'd try it. And this is the site we have. Uh, and just before I talk about the process, which will take me a little bit over time, sorry. <laughs> uh, the site uh, is uh, on a, a croft on, on Loch Snizet at the northwest end of Sky. Uh, we've started with one commercial polytunnel, that's about 90 feet by 20 feet, with the pond inside. We were quite determined to, to try and follow the best practice we could. So none of the land we've taken was land that was in use by the crofters. That's their main silage field uh, there. Uh, so the land we took was wasteland just before you got onto the, the shore. Uh, which had never been used. And when we cleared the site, all the uh, earth was from the site was put along here on the lock shore, 
to create earth buns to protect the polytunnels and to help them settle more into the landscape, not be so obtrusive. Uh, and so we uh, started on that basis with one, and you can see we've expanded to three. We tried to minimize the use of concrete, so the only concrete we've got on the site is uh, the concrete posts for anchoring the polytunnel poles, uh, the hoops, so that they won't blow away in the winter storms. Uh, it would have been easier to put down a load of concrete with self-leveling floor, <laughs> uh, but we actually used uh, shingle, beet shingle, uh, from the farm and uh, hand-leveled the ponds, uh, which I never want to do again. Uh, it was weeks of just f f sieving the, the shingle and then patting it down with, that, with the wood. So uh, just a nightmare job. Uh, the polytunnels themselves, the hoops, galvanized steel, and the plastic, uh, the plastic pond floors, and all the wood can be re pretty much recycled uh, as well at end of use or on replacement we can uh, source uh, specialist recyclers for the plastic uh, covers and for the ponds. And we use recycled pond liner. So it's, recyc it's uh, LLDPE, which is a food safe uh, polyethylene, and uh, it's recycled as well. So uh, we've done as much as we can on that. And then at the end of life, when that site is no longer used uh, for salt production, we can remove everything, that everything's a temporary structure and the land can be, well, with apologies to the archaeologists in the audience, the land can be restored to its natural state, uh, and it will be as if we were never there. Um, so that's the kind of thinking that went into the business on the environment side. Uh, in terms of the process, uh, we pump water from the lock into the ponds, and you can get a sense of the scale of the ponds there. Uh, goes through a filter, 25 micron filter, before it, the water goes into the ponds. And all the doors, windows, and the sides of the, the polytunnels are meshed to avoid any insects getting in. Uh, and then we let the wind and the sun do what it does. Um, and this is what we end up with. Uh, the sun heats, the seawater begins to evaporate it, the wind blows through clears the saturated air and the cycle continues until we get down to salt crystals forming on the floor of the ponds. And then uh, we literally sweep it up uh, into piles. And if I just take you back for a second, you'll see the piles of salt inside the polytunnels after we've swept them up. And a small uh, tunnel you can see in the middle is a drying tunnel and that's been set up to allow us to put the salt and dra it drains and further drying by the sun so until we can put it into tubs to take it back for sorting and packing. We've tried to run the environmental thinking through. The packaging, we did some research work with um, Robert Gordon University, their Centre for Understanding Sustainability. Uh, we've got two problems with salt. One is its long life. So, uh, it, well, it will last pretty much forever. Uh, but we put a five-year best before date. But you've got to have packaging that will last for five years. And the other thing is salt's hygroscopic, so it will absorb moisture when it's exposed to air. And uh, so we needed uh, to make sure that was okay. So we ended up with uh, a card outer uh, and a plastic inner, so all of which can be recycled and the card tubes can be reused. And to that effect, we've also introduced a, a refill pack. So once you run out of the initial uh, pack of salt, you can order a refill and it goes into the tub and you can keep using it for years, basically. Uh, so that's um, that side of it. Uh, since we started, we've been very lucky to get a good reception. Uh, we've won a number of awards. In 2014, we got the Great Taste Award, which is a blind tasting uh, and is done by the sort of uh, speciality food people. Uh, and 
in 2014, we also won the Environment Award at Highland Food and Drink Awards, and that was for the process. That was for the thinking and the application of the thinking into the process and the start of the business. Uh, and then in 2015, we got uh, an excellence award at the Scotland Food and Drink Award. So all of that, um, it's not bragging, it's just kind of recognising that we've tried to think things through very carefully. We've tried to produce a really high quality product. Uh, and I guess the accolades are, are proof of that, that we've managed to achieve that. Uh, and that's more or less uh, everything from me. Well, first of all, um, Joe and the team, thank you so much uh, for inviting us to uh, this really interesting day. I mean, quite momentous, actually, because it's the first SOT symposium ever, I think, in the history of Scotland, uh, somebody told me. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you know, we feel really honoured to be here. Um, so you get two for the price of one with, uh, with, this, with our presentation. Um, we get asked a lot. We obviously have come into Scotland. Uh, we have come from elsewhere and we get asked a lot um, about where did we get the experience to be producers of, um, you know, the most sustainable uh, production uh, of sea salt in sky. Um, so what we thought we would do is I would actually just talk a little bit about where we came from and what kind of experience we brought with us. Um, so we've been on Sky for 15 years um, and we both came to Sky prior to that with uh, t about 25, 25 years of work experience um, where sustainable features actually played a key role in our decisions to take uh, various jobs over the years. I think they became more and more important, really, as we got older and, uh, and became involved with a whole range of things. So going back, I'm just going to give you a little snapshot of this, but going back a long time ago, it feels like another lifetime. Uh, both of us actually worked in Papua New Guinea um, in the late 1980s. Uh, we worked there for three years um, and we were actually responsible for uh, voluntary service overseas, uh, which I'm sure many of you know about, VSO. At the time, it was um, the largest VSO programme um, uh, that there was. And there were over 90 projects and uh, it covered a whole range of different topic areas and was just so interesting, such an interesting country to work in so many ways. But a key lesson that we learnt uh, from those three years was that those who have the least are the most resourceful. And the respect for the land at the time that the Papua New Guineans had and their, their ability to, to be self-sufficient um, was really, in, uh, really interesting to us and uh, kind of stayed with us in, in many different ways. So that was both of us together. And a li little bit of a uh, snapshot of Chris's experience. So talking about this Chris, the eminent Chris Watley sitting over there. But Chris Watts is quite an eminent person to me as well. <laughs> so Chris, um, many again, we're going back quite a few years, um, has been lead officer in s on sustainability uh, with the Housing Corporation. He's been a senior consultant with the Energy Saving Trust. He's been a co-founder and director of his own company um, called Beyond Green, which was way ahead of his time as a built environment consultancy. He has been uh, on the design review panel for the National Health Service, and he has also been on the National Design Review Panel for CAPE, which is a commission for architecture and the built environment. And uh, also, um, as a design review consultant for architecture and design in Scotland when we moved to Sky. Um, so that kind of just gives you a feel for the range of sort of jobs that uh, he would have done in order to be invited to sit on many of those things. Uh, for myself, a um, little snapshot of, um, of where I've, I've come from as well. Um, in the mid-1990s, I was asked to help set up 
um, and helped set up and create the national and local infrastructure in Estonia, um, in health promotion in Estonia, which was a newly independent um, state, and um, also to help build up the country-based skills around health promotion. To me, this was music to my ears. I've already been involved with international development for quite some time, but to, it, to be responsible for a program which had the strategic, operational and community and be able to work in a cyclical way um, was going to be both challenging and really interesting. Um, it was a two-year program and um, all I will really say was that um, it wasn't planned, the end result of it, but it was evaluated by the EC and it actually won a first prize in a, as an international award for its level of innovation and sustainable features. Um, the award also included, thankfully for the Estonians, a $10,000 cheque to invest back into, into the health of uh, their citizens. And so they were well happy with that. Um, I went on to do similar stuff in Latvia and Bulgaria. Um, in the late 1990s still, and um, early in the 2000s, I was asked to uh, manage a scheme called Business Partners for Development, uh, which was set up by the World Bank. Um, sadly, my salary wasn't. It was actually an NGO salary, but um, it was the first uh, sort of um, scheme office type to try and get uh, the business sector and um, the civil society and governments to actually work together and try and have a you know, maximum impact into various areas of really important work. And so mine was sort of the first identified uh, topic area, which was to speed up water and sanitation uh, to the urban poor in six middle-income countries. And so countries such as South Africa and Colombia and Argentina were um, involved with this. It was a really challenging uh, program to set up. Um, anyway, so in addition to this, I have worked in lots of different parts of the world. But I'm just going to leave that there. Um, but just to say that both of our choices um, in our work has always been to do with sustainable elements um, because we both had a very strong principle that what we left behind was tangible benefits um, to the communities and all the countries or the people we worked with, um, as opposed to the opposite. <laughs> so, so now we're on the Isle of Skye. We moved there 15 years ago, our beautiful, beautiful island, um, and, uh, which is now our home and we absolutely love it. Um, as well as developing our sea salt business, um, for me, I've been privileged to be asked chair of Skydance many years ago. I've been a board director for our community theatre in Aros, uh, in Portree. And you know what, folks, I've most definitely introduced Bollywood dancing, which is Indian dancing, to people of all, all ages and all sizes, local people, and we've had lots of fun doing that. So for me, um, my two current passions, um, which is our sea salt, and dance all came together when Darcy Russell asked to visit our salt site and feature us in her salt programme last year. It was a very special moment. Um, the other thing I did want to share with you, I was actually born in India. And so after the research was done, which was really Chris is the mastermind behind all of that aspect of it, and we decided to Go, you know, we decided to go with the, the sea salt idea and we felt that we really could um, really make it a sustainable process from lock to larder. Um, I did actually have a vision of Mahatma Gandhi in India, who um, many of you will know if we're talking about salt and its impact, as has been mentioned in the past, um, who led his fight against the steep salt tax that was imposed by the British on salt produced in India. The 241-mile march, we all, I'm sure, are aware, had a huge impact. So salt has always been a 
golden commodity. And um, you know what? I just think it it's always going to be that way in so many different ways. And uh, I just feel so privileged that, you know, we do, that we've been sort of part of it and somehow it's come into our life. For me, that flash of Mahatma Gandhi, somebody who was born in India and sort of felt as though I'd come full circle, really, which was a, a really nice feeling. I mean this in a really nice way. Um, and also just the Indian in me feels that Actually, it was our destiny to come to um, Sky and, and to, to, to make sea salt. <laughs> so we certainly hadn't planned it 25 years ago. <laughs> and uh, I can actually just see Mahatma Gandhi up there having a wee little chuckle. Sea salt, Bollywood dancing on the Isle of Sky. Way to go. <laughs>